Welcome you guys to the first, first episode of Life Beyond Sun Devil Football. I am your host, Danny Clark. Unfortunately, Emily will not be able to make it today, but we're all good. You guys go ahead and follow me on Instagram, Bannon.Clark, that is B-A-N-N-O-N dot C-L-A-R-K, as well as Emily's at Emily, that's C-S-A-C-I-A. We are here for episode one. We interview current and former Arizona State football players, talk to them about their experiences and everything. So let's kick it off. Episode one, we got ourselves a baller, play tight end, number 92 on the 2017 roster, 260 plus pounds. My man, Alexander Otero. Alex, how you doing? I'm good. How are you, man? I'm good. Doing good. This is going to be a first episode, so it'll be a little rocky. It'll be all good, but I'm really excited. Yeah. We appreciate you doing this interview. I appreciate y'all having me. Yeah, so we're going to get up to the first question. Of coming out of high school, um, obviously, you're from New- you're from the New Yorker, from the East Coast area, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. Um, gotta- what was that recruitment process, just going to Arizona State? Was it more of a walk-on? Was it you were already getting a full ride D1? What was that recruitment process like, just Arizona State? Uh, I actually didn't get recruited um, out of high school. I ended up going to a Division three football school okay. my first semester of a uh, first semester of college, and then I just kind of chose Arizona State and said I was going to walk in on the team. There was absolutely no contact with the coaches whatsoever. No contact. Um, were at least in- schools involved besides Arizona State that you were choosing because co- coming out of D three is Arizona State the only option basically for you. So I mean, when I transferred out of my D three school, I actually like I didn't play football for two years. I, all I did was train and um, there was zero recruitment. I literally just had the goal of like, okay, I'm going to go and play. And that was it. And was there any, any doubt in your mind, just thinking that you would, because I feel like any football player, I was never a football player myself, but I know those Mm -hmm. aspirations of making a D1. And I know that it's a tough process for anyone. And especially that training process, was there any, bumps in the road for you just any doubts or maybe anything that you were like there's no way that I'm gonna be able to make a d1 uh I think the the day where I had my most or the like really the only doubts in the process was the first day training I was really out of shape and my trainer absolutely absolutely beat me to shreds so like he I remember him saying maybe a year after he was like I was worried that you weren't even gonna come back but no, I mean, like, literally from the from day two of training, I said I was an Arizona State football player, like, and I just said it over and over and over and over again. And I just did it, made it happen. You know, that was it. And obviously, you being an Arizona uh, player, talk about those experiences. You talk about the training early on. What was just oh, yeah. the locker room presence and just overall? Because you did play with a lot of talented guys on that team. Um, if I'm yeah. not mistaken, you did you not? You played with Nikhil Harry, mm-hmm. um, Kaylin. You played with a lot of guys, NFL talent, borderline NFL mm-hmm. talent. You still yeah. played with these guys. What was that locker room like? Um, well, at first I will say like, you know, as the new guy, you know, there were, there were a couple, couple players that were like, that would look out for me. I don't know if you know, Steve, Steve Miller. So yeah, vaguely, it, vaguely. Yeah. Yeah. He, he was an old lineman in the old locker room. He actually had a locker right next to me. So like, he kind of gave me some guidance and that was it. But ultimately, you know, it was like, you know, I was dealt a hand of cards and, and it was like, you know, it was up to me really to form relationships with, with the guys in the locker room. It was, uh, I don't know there, there was just energy though. I will say, you know, like, mm-hmm. and true, like an energy of, of just like an energy of talent, um, wanting to constantly get better. And, and also like just competition, it was so competitive in that locker room. I mean, like, you know, obviously there were times where we would have such good times, but I mean, like, you know, especially before practice, I remember like there would just be like a tension in the air, like, you know, like, but that's, that's, I guess what I remember from the beginning, but training was definitely hard. I remember the first day of uh, workouts in the summer that we were doing, like the, they had the walk-ons doing testing and I was, we went hard and, and I remember I got on the tram to head over from the weight room to the, um, to the fields. And I had my head down and my, my buddy Jacoby was sitting next to me and he was like, he was like, it's over for Alex. And I mean, we step off the tram and I'm dry heaving. Like it was. Well, I mean, the Phoenix weather, the Phoenix weather in general, wasn't that friendly with you guys at all. I feel like I'm from Palm Springs, California, and it's literally the same temperature as in here in Phoenix. So it wasn't that hard of an adjustment. So I feel like, yeah, Yeah. that off season conditioning was just not, it was not the move. It definitely was. 
it was tough. Yeah. And, and speaking of just off season, what as a student, because you also are a student at that point, correct? You're mm-hmm. also a student. What was your schedule looking like from off season to on season? I know that there's a lot mm-hmm. more off season, just conditioning like how we're talking about earlier. No. And on season, obviously you have games, you have meetings, you have all that while content, while doing your classes and doing all that. Talk to me yeah. about that. Just being a student athlete. Um, so, I mean, obviously, you know, we, we would wake up pretty early, get in and, you know, I, I was pretty hit or, hit or miss with like the, the treatment, like the warming up my body, you know, but ultimately we would get in probably like 630 in the morning, have breakfast, you know, about an hour and a half, two hours of meetings. And then we'd be practicing. And then, you know, after practice, you shower, you kind of talk with your teammates, you have lunch. And then we'd probably finish up around 1230, one o'clock. And then at that time you'd go straight to classes. But, uh, I like after my classes, I would go eat at the dining hall and then that would probably be around like five o'clock. And then I would go do some homework in the library from like, you know, five 30 to, I don't know, eight. Um, and then I would honestly, like, I would go drive Postmates, um, cause I, I was a walk on, so I had to make some, some form of cash. Um, like I, you know, I I just tried to have some extra, like, like money to, to just yeah. kind of blow a little bit but um and then i would get back in the in the film room probably around like i want to say like 11 and then be there till one two in the morning um just studying trying to learn you know because obviously you know that as a walk-on right like you're not treated with any special treatment you're you know you're thrown into the fire and it's yeah. up to you to like it's uh, it's up to you to, to learn the playbook it's up to you to get close with your coaches and your your other teammates and just kind of like like indulge in it just like yeah it's it's like it it truly is like a fire hose to the face you know what i mean like like yeah, i mean you talk about so, the, the amount of work that you're putting in especially for a walk-on yeah. you're literally getting four or five hours of sleep and i mean i'm not gonna say that the coaches don't care but obviously you're trying to push yourself and believe that and push yeah. yourself as an arizona state football player because you aren't you're a walk-on you're not a full scholarship player but speaking of coaches yeah. you brought that up you were also, mm-hmm. I'm, if I'm not mistaken, you were, your head coach at the time was not Herm Edwards, it was Todd Graham, correct? Yeah, I was, I was there during uh, Todd Graham's last year. Last year. So you guys finished mm-hmm. seven and five that year, uh, obviously five mm-hmm. and seven the previous year. Uh, yeah. Obviously the energy in the room, I presume Todd Graham obviously resigned and then comes in Herm Edwards. But what was coach mm-hmm. Graham like? I know it's such, it's so hard for a lot of these Arizona State people to understand because Todd Graham's a good coach and also, but Herm Edwards is just more, much more that name because of his past work in ESPN, how he was as a player. What was Coach yeah. Graham like to you in all honesty, just as a, as a coach and how he, how he treated that locker room and was a side note, I know some stuff for you to say, was there a feeling that he was going to get fired at the end of that season? Um, so Coach Graham, honestly, like he's a huge part of the reason as to why I even got the opportunity to play. So, you know, I'm, I'm forever grateful for him because without him and there's another coach called uh, his name is uh, Billy Napier, coach Billy Napier, the OC that year. If it wasn't for those two guys, I I don't think I would have been on the team. Um, But coach Graham, he was a great coach, a very passionate man, like really passionate about his work. Um, I just, I can't really speak to how other guys like, feel or like the energy towards him because I mean I can only say like I I was just super grateful and I you know granted there there were some things where like he definitely compared to Herm Edwards right where like he's more of a player's coach you know we'd we'd be on the field you know for hours at a time every day and it was just all about work it's very old school mentality I will say that's that's what I'll say about it um what were your other questions I I do apologize oh did, did he did he so I will say after the a, the U of A game, mm-hmm. um, I think he might have said at the press conference, like, like he did say so. I do actually yeah. remember that he said something along those lines. But I yeah. mean, with the how the record was and everything, and also at that time, I mean, Arizona State football had a, such a spell of coaches. Dirk Cutter was one former T- Tampa Bay Buccaneers head coach, and you got Todd mm-hmm. Graham. But what yeah. I was saying from a player standpoint was that like after that U of A game, and obviously the press conference, was it a feeling like okay, this is his last season? I will say like maybe at the beginning of the season, I, again, I only was there one season, so I, I don't, yeah. I can't compare it to any other, any correct. other time, yeah, correct. but um, I think there was a difference in like energy from coach Graham, you know, from spring ball to fall of the season, just that like spring ball was a little bit more 
more relaxed. He, there was more of a confidence where, you know, I guess when, and again, I can't, I can't say for him, but yeah. I guess what I was getting from him was that maybe there was a feeling of scarcity. And, and I think in a sense, he, there was a shift in energy and I don't really know how to describe it, but it, yeah. it was just different, you know, mm-hmm. but maybe, maybe he got a warning. I, I'm not sure, but ultimately at the end of it all, I'm just grateful for coach Graham. That's, that's it. But yeah. Now you've, um, I know this is a tough thing. I know football players always have to deal with injuries. And yeah. uh, were there any injuries that you suffered in your career? Um, I feel, I feel like obviously just not much more this year, but we know in the past, obviously how with the NFL mm-hmm. talking about CTE and concussions and how big of a yeah. deal and the preventions they made. Uh, were there any, uh, any other injuries that you suffered or maybe just like the process is just recovering and mm-hmm. getting back to that full shake. Just talk about that experience for you at all. Um, like during the season or after? During, after, I feel oh. after no matter what, your body's got to be so beat up just from playing yeah. those football games and that entire time yeah. that offseason is recovery. But yeah, especially that. So uh, during the season, I mean, actually before the season even started, I uh, it was during spring ball. That's when I got my first labrum tear in my left hip. And then because my body was overcompensating, I got one in my right. During the season, I got um, a concussion during the first bye week. And that was bad. That put me out of commission for about two weeks. But, you know, I like thinking back to it, I, my parents were coming out to the USC game from New York. So I kind of lied to get back on the field. And I guess that's like, that's bad on me, but uh, I guess may, maybe I'm incriminating myself and in, in saying that, but. Only, yeah, um, I don't know. We, we won't tell the feds or anything. Hopefully they didn't. Yeah. Watching this, or yeah. like some, some governing board in college football, they like come out and come out <laughs> Heck, I don't know. They're after student athletes. I guess yeah, not anymore. Sure. Now they're going to be getting paid. But, um, and then my last concussion was um, December 29th during the Sun Bowl, and that was weird. When I like, I cried, started crying on impact. Like I, and then I couldn't see anything. But, you know, during the during the season for my labral tears, tears in my hips, um, there's not really much that you can like do because it's a tendon. And it's like, it doesn't heal the same as a, as a, as muscle tissue. So like, I just, they gave me cortisone shots and I think I may have gotten like three, four or five between both hips. I don't really remember how many it was. It might've been three or four. I, again, I don't, I don't know, but anyways, that was big. Um, for a brief moment, they would give me a pill called Tordal before every game. And it, it's like Tylenol, but like times 10. So like it, you kind of get like a numbing feeling before the game and like you just don't really feel your, your ailments. Um, you know, healing from my concussions, I will say that that was probably the biggest thing. I, after the season, you know, I went into, you know, the, the doctors had, had recommended that like, okay, if you get one more concussion, I don't think we're going to be able to like it. We're going to not allow you to really continue playing. And at that moment I was like, you know, why worth my health you know this is what they're telling me this is you know you know there's a chance of of issues that can come up due to these concussions way down the road and you know I want to live a healthy life I want to have a family I want to have a wife like you know so to put all that at risk for a game is wasn't really worth it so um but, you know, when, when you're a football player and you're a football player or an athlete of any sort, of any sport, you know, you know, when you do it for such a long time, you identify as that, right? That's that's a part of you, right? And so when I wasn't playing anymore, I, I felt like I completely lost myself. So, like, you know, I completely went down this rabbit hole of depression. I didn't touch a weight for – I was, like, very on and off. I maybe worked out once every two weeks I put on tons of weight, um, but ultimately, man, I like, I started meditating and like, I got a job as a personal trainer and it like, I don't know, like that was, meditation was a huge part of, of healing my body and healing my brain along with working out, but, but really getting my mind straight was, was a huge thing. And, and understanding that, you know, football is not the see all end all. It's not, you know, so and I think that's something that a lot of, you know, NCAA athletes struggle with is that, you know, once you stop playing, you know, what do you, what do you do? What do you like, do? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, 
but yeah, I, I guess if that answers your question, I mean, meditation was a huge thing that, that saved me. Um, and like really healed my body, healed my brain. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's an incredible, I mean, that's an incredible story right there. And just kind of, kind of wrapping it up. I mean, we obviously talked mm-hmm. a lot, talked a lot about injuries and we just kind of finished up on that. What advice for people that have, that are going to pass that will experience injuries or have experienced the same things that you have, you've had your struggles mm-hmm. and clearly yeah. you thinking maybe this is not my only option, but then now coming to a realization, talking about meditation, now you're a personal mm-hmm. trainer, beginning that job. What advice do you give to these NCAA athletes that don't maybe no, don't think that there is another way out? Maybe that don't, they think like football is the only thing that they can do and coming out and there's nothing else for them to do. So what advice would you give them if just, if you had that chance? Well, I guess I would say, do you feel like you're incapable of doing something else? Because that's what you've been told your entire life. Like, and that's, that's pretty much a question that I would start with, but ultimately like, you know, we all have a brain. We're all, we're all born different. We are like truly, truly built so different from one another and and to think that you know the sport that you play is is the only thing that you're capable of doing within this life of say I don't know 75 to 100 years that you're going to live is is small-minded and and quite frankly a little foolish so I would just say you know you know explore your options explore your your passions um, before before you even come close to ending your career start early and understand what it is that you love about yourself, what it is that you love to do. Um, heck, I, I, I don't know. I found training, so like, I guess, I guess, explore your passions before you, you know, that's even in question of ending your career. Um, and, or if if you truly love football or love the sport that you're in, find a way to give back to players after you. Say like, I don't know, become a trainer and train them, or you know, become a mentor of some sort and and show them that or become a mentor and, and give them, I don't know, pers- perspective on based on your experience, I, I guess I can say. So um, yeah, I guess the only thing I would say is, is just explore your, explore your heart, explore what, what you want in your life other than football or outside of yeah. it. So. Oh, well, we, first off, we appreciate you having it on, on Alex and just kind of real quickly, we're going to get, we're going to yep. get a little more on the happier side right now. Uh, okay. Kind of step away from football. Uh, we got I got two segments on here, uh, new segments. Uh, first one is called Check That Tweet. So we may or may not yeah. have deep dived into your Twitter and just checked out maybe some of your content, seeing some of your tweets. Um, I want to oh, take you back goodness. a little, take you back a little bit to December fifteenth, twenty fifteen, and I, this is for all the athletes out there. I mean, myself, I played oh, basketball for three years. Played basketball for three years. Mm-hmm. You played football. And I think a lot of people understand this feeling and it, it goes, it goes like this, taking your shoes off after getting out of the gym is probably one of the best feelings ever. Yeah. That's so I, I respect that tweet. I, I yeah. think a lot of people understand that it's a great feeling. It's a great I feeling. You went through my Twitter. What, was oh the con- what was the context behind that tweet? If you don't remember, it's all good, but I I, we, I I, for the many people that understand that feeling, it's a great yeah. feeling. So what, what was the context behind that tweet? The context behind that tweet was that I literally got home from a training session and I <laughs> took my took my shoe up, shoes off and I was like, wow, this is such a great feeling. I'm going to tweet about it. So that's what I did is I tweeted about it. And it's such a true feeling. Literally, it's what I did just before hopping on this call. Like just that feeling of, oh. Were you working out? Dude. Were you working out before here, before this interview? Yeah, I was. I was. <laughs> but yeah, dude, it, it's just it's five, it's six truly, years later. It's still one of the best. It's still like the most relevant tweet. It's like one of the better tweets. 100%. Agreed. 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 <laughs> that's incredible, right? That that's agreed. like that's just who would have thought right then and there. You just you're casually at the gym, and that tweet still lives on five years later. Like who? who I, you know, heck, may, maybe this this question will come up. You know, fifty years down the road, and I'll probably still be like, "Yep, that's facts." You know, for all of us, I feel like I would say the same thing too. I mean, you know, we yeah. have to do a research here at Life on Sunday Little Football. We have to do a research here at all times. Yeah, so that's going on oh, Twitter, man. Instagram, or anything. But last thing we're going to do, my favorite, rapid fire questions. I got 10 questions for you. Try to say them as quickly as possible. We asked a bunch okay. of students as well as myself. Just overall, what you like, what you don't like. So here we go. Question one, burgers or tacos? Uh, burgers. Best pregame song before a football game? Oh, uh, I guess Lose Yourself. Lose Yourself. Who, are, not- you an, are you an NBA fan? No, I'm not. You're not? Favorite, favorite basketball team, favorite football team? Uh, Knicks and Giants. Knicks and Giants. All right. Favorite football player right now? Or of all time? Saquon Barkley. 
And of all time. Of all time? Oh, Tom Brady, bro. What? I mean, <laughs> Tom Brady. Yeah. Hard, it's hard, hard to say for like as a New York fan. I mean, it's hard to say as a New York fan, but still, like Tom you know, Brady's still the goat. I used to I used to argue with people about Joe Montana, and then uh, you know because I hated Joe uh, Tom Brady, but same like, here. You know, I I guess I've come to the realization that he is the goat. Yeah, that's he it. Is. He's the goat, man. That's it. That, that that is true. Funniest teammate you've ever played with? Oh, Dylan Sterling Cole. <laughs> favorite win <laughs> favorite win is a football player in your one season at Arizona State. What was your favorite win? Oh, the U of A game. U of A game. Yeah. What do you go to for advice, just football wise or just life wise? Um, I guess I, I mean, I, I look to God. Look to I don't God. know if that makes sense, but yeah, I, yeah, go ahead. Favorite movie of all time? Oh, Fury. Oh, that's a good one. That's a, a good really one. good one. Yeah. That's a good one. Favorite artist right now? Um, she's J. Cole. J. Cole. Favorite yeah. song by J. Cole. This is, this is a big one. Oh, um, uh love yours that's the that's the name Ooh, of the yeah that's okay that's actually from that from that album 24 from four sales job that's easily one of my favorite songs yeah. it's that that or like wet dreams but like come on now like love yours. Yeah. Fact, <laughs> yeah. love yours is an impactful song i can't deny that yeah. last yeah. question if you had a superpower alex what would that be um it'd probably be to fly to be honest to fly wow. mine's invisibility though i don't know flying would be good but it just would be too it'd be interesting I, you know, I, but like, do people say they want to be invisible or have that power because they don't want to be seen? Like, I, I don't care who yeah. sees me. I just want to, I want to fly and get to wherever I want to be. Put a backpack on my back. And, hey. hey, take a day trip. To hey, Florida only if, if to back be. when you were a Postmates driver, if you were able to fly around with Postmates, like, oh, that'd be, man. that'd be clutch. You know how much gas that would have saved me? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. How much gas that would have saved you. Yeah, exactly. Oh, my gosh. Well, Alex, thank you so much for being a part of the first episode here. We appreciate you. Make sure to go ahead you. and follow my Instagram. Link will be in the bio. Alex, we appreciate you. Stay safe, man. I appreciate you too, man.